Maya Astronomy in the Dresden Codex. The Mayans wrote an enormous amount of books, including many books on astronomy. But unfortunately, few of the Spanish conquistadors managed to appreciate the wealth of astronomical knowledge that the Maya had uncovered over the centuries. In fact, tragically, they burned almost all of the Mayan books in an attempt to weed out their pagan beliefs. Shockingly, only four Mayan books from pre-Columbian times exist. Yet, among those four books, there is one spectacular book known as the Dresden Codex. Hey, good to see you. This is Stefan, author of In Search of the Sublime. On this World History Channel, we'll trace humanity's relentless pursuit of scientific truth, moral excellence and enlightenment. We'll meet anyone from Mesopotamian astronomers and Indian yogis, to Greek philosophers and Enlightenment scientists. And you'll meet them firsthand using primary sources, giving you valuable insights that transcend the surface level understanding you get on other channels. Go check it out for yourself. Let's start. The Dresden Codex was written around the 12th century AD. And similar to what we have seen in Mesopotamian astronomy, the Codex gives us astronomical data for the purpose of predicting the will of the gods. The first 23 pages of the book give us straight omens based on the strange 260 day or 13 times 20 day Solkin calendar of the Mayas. Let's now go through some of these pages to give you an idea of the beauty of this manuscript. And we'll go into more detail in a bit. Below I've taken out one little part from those first pages, so we can understand a bit better what is going on. Let's start with the numbers. The numbers in black that the arrows point to read 15, 33 and 4. And if you've seen my lecture on the Mayan calendar, you know how to count for yourself. A bar is 5, so the first number has 3 bars, so that's 15. The second number has 3 bars and then 3 dots above it which is 10 plus 3 is 13, but then the symbol to the left represents 20, so we have a total of 33, and then the third number is just 4 dots, so that's 4. These black numbers together add up to 52, which is also an important number in the Mayan calendar. Let's now look at the red numbers. We see in order the number 4, 6, 13, and then 4 again. And I'll now show you how those red numbers are related to the black ones. If we add that number 4, the first red number, to 15, the first black number, then in that 13 day Solkin cycle, we get to the next red number, namely 6. How does this work? 15 plus 4 is 19, minus 13 gives us 6. If we then add the next number, 33, we get to the next red number, which is 13. How does this work? Well, 6 plus 33 is 39. And if we subtract 13 twice, we then get to 13. It's a strange way of counting, but that's how those numbers are related. What we now do is that we have to cycle through this table five times, corresponding to the five day glyphs that we see on the left. And if we do that five times, we get to a total of 5 times 52 is those 260 days. So one of these boxes in these many pages corresponds to 260 days. Now let's focus on the images below. The images tell us about omens. The first image, for instance, shows a female carrying the skeleton death god on her back, which of course isn't a good sign. The text above the numbers then reads, quote, Death is the burden of the moon goddess, bad winds. And then, Two blue yellow, whatever that means, is the burden of Ixchel, the moon goddess. Mui is her burden, the divination of the moon goddess. What this all means specifically is not that clear, but it is an example of one of these omens. On pages 52 to 58 of the Dresden Codex, we find horoscopes based on the recurrence of lunar and solar eclipses. And here it becomes more interesting from an astronomical perspective. Let's again go through some of these pages before we dive in deeper. The image we see here on the bottom left actually represents a solar eclipse. 
And here on the right is another one. And here we can see that a bit clearer. In the middle of that solar eclipse image, we see the symbol of the sun, which is also depicted on the right. And by the way, that sun is attached to a band, which is actually the band of the zodiac, through which the sun, the moon, and the planets revolve around the earth. And here we see a lunar goddess who is hanged on that zodiac belt. This represents a lunar eclipse, which is often interpreted as the death of the moon. And here another solar eclipse. And another one, and below it we see here a dragon eating the sun. And another one. Now let's take a little chunk from these pages and understand what they mean. Along the bottom of these pages, the number 177 is repeated over and over again. Let's do some Mayan counting. The black number on the bottom left consists of three bars, which is 15 plus 2 is 17. The red number above it is 5 plus 3 is 8, but the number above it has to be multiplied always by 20. More on this in my lecture on the Mayan calendar, by the way. So that becomes 8 times 20 is 120 plus the 17 below, and that gives us 177. In some cases, we also see the number 148. For instance, the second red arrow in this image points to one of those numbers. So what do those two numbers refer to? 177, 148. Well, it turns out they correspond to the number of days in respectively six and five lunar months. And these are intervals at which lunar and solar eclipses often recur. So they are very appropriate numbers on tables clearly to do with solar and lunar eclipses. Now let's look at the black numbers way up the page. These numbers read, for instance, 6,408, 6,585, 6,762, and so on. What we here have is a cumulative number adding those numbers at 177, 148 from below. And interestingly, this also includes the famous Saros interval of 6,585 days, after which lunar and solar eclipses are even more likely to reoccur. We can also look at the intervals between the pictures, and these numbers are stated here. And they also all correspond to real eclipse cycles. And if we cycle through all the pages of the lunar and solar eclipse tables, we end up at 11,960 days, after which the cycle starts all over again. Well, what's the meaning of that? Well, 11,960 days is equal to about 405 moons. And by the way, also equal to 46 Tolkien, precisely. But the number of moons is more important here. Because from this we can calculate the average lunar month only 7 minutes removed from its current value. Very impressive. As you might imagine, the lunar and the solar eclipse tables also contain omens. For instance, one of the pages includes an image of the god of death. We see it here on the side. And the text reads, Damage the earth sky, the lord. Eclipse of the sun. Moon by one sky bearded lord, bad omen or wind, damage to the seats, or whatever that means. On the pages before the eclipse table, we see a few columns of numbers. In black here, we read from top to bottom 9, 16, 4, 10, 8, and 9, 16, 4, 10, 18. And in red, we read 9, 16, 4, 11, 3 and 919878. And these respond to calendar dates of the famous Mayan long count calendar. More on how this works in my lecture on the Mayan calendar. But what is important for now is that the first three dates have an interval between them of 15 days. And this might refer to the fact that solar eclipses, which always happen at new moon, happen about 15 days after lunar eclipses, which occur at full moon. So this might be another reference to these eclipses. Spectacularly, the Dresden Codex also has a Venus table. And here we see a few of those beautiful tables that we'll discuss in more detail in a bit. In these tables, the motion of Venus is divided 
into its time as a morning star when Venus rises above the horizon before the setting of the sun and its appearance as an evening star when it appears just after the sun has set. And then we also have those two periods in between where Venus is not visible because it is either in front or behind the sun. On the bottom of these Venus pages, we see repeated numbers 236, 90, 250 and 8, which given the text above should correspond to these four intervals, morning star disappeared, evening star disappeared. But strangely, these values are incorrect. We don't really understand why. After all, it shouldn't be too difficult to count the number of days that Venus is visible. Yet, what does work is the following. If we add those four dates, we get to 584 days, which is in fact the correct period of Venus. If we look at the table more closely, we see that at various points, some days are subtracted to give an even closer approximation of the period. As a result, after 301 revolutions of Venus, which are described, which corresponds to 481 years, about 24 days are subtracted here and there. And if we do the math, this gives a value for that 301 revolutions of Venus, just 1.2 hours removed from the modern value. So their measurement of the period of Venus was extremely accurate, which can only be done if you observe for a long, long time. Above the numbers on the Venus pages, we also see a row of Venus glyphs. And we see one of those glyphs on the right side. And the glyphs above that state whether Venus is either appearing or disappearing and in what direction it is going. As you might remember, all of the Venus pages also show three pictures. The first shows an omen corresponding to the appearance of Venus. In the middle, we see the Venus god, Kokol Khan, often holding a spear. And at the bottom, we see the stab victim of the Venus god. Let's go through one example of these pictures. Here we see the omen, here we see Venus holding a spear, and here finally we see the stabbed victim. The Dresden Codex also had a short Mars table, which is extremely interesting. And as you can see here, it depicts the so-called Mars beast hanging from the zodiac. And in the top right, by the way, we also see the Mars glyph, which is the head of the Mars beast. And here we see the second part of the table, again with three of those Mars beasts. To the left of the Mars table, we see a row of numbers with on top again that Mars glyph and underneath a long count date, in this case 919-890, which if you would convert it to a number of days, is a multiple of 780, which is equal to the period of Mars. Now let's look at the black numbers underneath the Mars beasts. You can do the counting yourself if you wish, and then you'll find that together they add up to 78 days, which is a tenth of the orbit of Mars. A table to the left of the Mars beasts then shows all multiples of 78 from 1 till 10, suggesting we have to cycle through this table 10 times which gives us again that 780 days, the period of Mars. Lastly, the text also contains some mysterious large numbers. Here to the right, we see in black the long count dates 991600 and 999160. And to the left of those two columns, we see 620, with zero, by the way, being depicted as a shell. Scholars have found out that some curious number games are going on here. For if we subtract 620 from the starting date of the long count calendar, which is 00000, again go to the Mayan calendar lecture for more, then we get to the date 12, 19, 13, 16, 0. If we then add the other number on the page, 991600, we get yet the other number on the page, 99160. So all these numbers are clearly related, but it isn't quite clear what is going on. But this might be a clue. If we convert that 991600 in a number of days, it corresponds to over a million days. And this exact number that you can see on the screen is divisible by a wide range of numbers that the Mayans deemed important. 
It is divisible by 260, the famous Tolkien calendar, by 365, the Hap or year calendar, by 584, that's the Venus period, by 780, that's the Mars period, and also by 18,980, which is the so-called calendar round that was also important. So this number, 991600, seems to track about every important cycle of Mayan astronomy. Very curious indeed. And finally we have to mention the mysterious large serpent numbers, although there is no consensus yet about their meaning. They are unusually large numbers, written within the curves of serpents, I'll show it in a minute, with some numbers exceeding 34,000 years. Why would they be tracking these insanely large numbers? And here we see again in red and black those numbers written between the curves of the serpent. Curiously, if we study the third column on the page after the serpent tables, we see at the bottom of the column the first day of the long count calendar. If we then subtract the number given above, that's the second red arrow, we exactly get to the date that we can see on the top of this column. So again, those numbers seem to be clearly related. If we then add the long count date in the middle, we get a huge number, 10.6.10.6.3. And if you've seen my lecture on the Mayan calendar, you notice that it's one number longer than the usual long count system. And that fifth number, the 10 on the left, is actually counted in pictoons which correspond to 2,880,000 days. Well, what's the meaning of this long count date? Well, it turns out that this date corresponds to a number written underneath the serpent. And if we add the number written above the serpent to the red numbers inside the serpent, we also get to the same date written underneath it. So all these numbers are related. They are clearly getting at something, but we're not sure yet what. There is one theory, however, that these numbers were perhaps used to correct for a phenomenon known as precession, which is a slow wobble in the Earth's axis that repeats itself every 26,000 years. And that would be a spectacular conclusion, because figuring this out requires very careful observation of the stars over long periods of time, actually centuries. And that is also how the Greeks eventually discovered it. What precession does, technically, is that it causes the year as defined by the seasons to be slightly shorter than the year as defined by the stars, the sun returning to the same stars. And with some imagination, and there isn't a scholarly consensus about this, a period of over 5 million days can be found next to the serpent, we can see it here on the left, which is equal to a close multiple of the 365 0.256 days of that star year, as opposed to the more commonly measured seasonal year. But as some of the critics have countered, this might just be a numbers game. If you look for all the numbers everywhere, you're eventually going to find a number that is divisible by the star year. And since we have no direct evidence that the Mayans dealt with precession, this theory is still unconfirmed. But it is an interesting idea nonetheless. And that, my friends, is what we know today about the fascinating Dresden Codex. If you want to know more about Mayan astronomy or many other topics from world history, read my book In Search of the Sublime. Of course, you can get a physical copy, but you can also read it for free, completely for free on my website, worldhistorybook.com. See you there.